Welcome to the government-wide category management virtual industry day of 2022. My name is Alyssa Cole and I'm the event manager over here at ATARC. We are pleased to partner with the government-wide category management PMO to host this event. We have a great turnout and a wonderful program. I am pleased to introduce Brian Isbrandt, director of the government-wide PMO for category management over at GSA. Brian leads the team that is responsible for supporting and helping OMB drive the federal government's implementation of category management practices and principles. He will kick off things for us today. Brian, over to you. Thank you, Alyssa. Hello and thank you all for joining today's Category Management Program's Industry Day. My name is Brian Isbrandt, the Director for the Government-Wide Category Management PMO. I look forward to spending the next two hours with you as we explore today's theme of spring into action, category management is a team sport. To assist in that, we've assembled an exciting lineup of speakers from OMB, EPA, GSA, and NASA to share their insights on how category management is helping to level the playing field for small business. With that, I'm happy to introduce our first speakers. Joining us from the Office of Management and Budget, are the Acting Administrator for Federal Procurement Policy, Leslie Field, and the Associate Administrator for the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, Matthew Bloom. Leslie, over to you. Great, Brian, thank you so much. I think maybe if you guys could turn on our video, that would be terrific. All right, there we go. Hopefully we will show up in just a second. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you all so much for being here today to talk with us about our important category management efforts and how they are helping us implement a number of key administration priorities. So just a few statistics to start. I understand there are over 1,100 folks on the line uh, and 33% uh, are small business or small business advocates and 21% uh, are small disadvantaged businesses and uh, almost 40% are gov. So it, it's a fantastic turnout. Thank you all so much for spending time with us today. I think a lot of you have been on the journey with us as we've evolved and expanded our approach to category management. Um, we've improved our data and our tools. We've trained our workforce and otherwise built, I think one of the most impressive and important infrastructures out there. So we now have people, data, solutions and relationships that we can leverage very quickly to help us solve problems, take advantage of opportunities, and otherwise act as a catalyst for change. So I know you all have these facts and figures memorized, um, but I use these a lot to help set the stage for discussions with our policy officials or industry or anyone else who is learning about the power of procurement. So we are the world's largest buyer of goods and services. In FY21, we spent over $630 billion through contracts for goods and services with over 120,000 entities um, I think there may be even more than that now, over 4 million contracts, maybe more than that now, awarded uh, by nearly 40,000 contracting officers um, with support from hundreds of thousands of other program managers and other folks who touch the system. And these awards accounted for nearly one out of every three discretionary dollars in FY21, so we're a huge and vast system. But thanks to the infrastructure that we built here through category management, we are finally much more organized better informed and far better positioned to act in the best interest of taxpayers and policymakers. Some of the key performance indicators from FY21 show the degree of success that we have continued to have. Uh, two thirds of what we spend is for common goods and services, 230 billion last year in spend under management, which exceeded our goal by 13%. Our cumulative cost avoidance was uh, 60 billion, which is 5 billion more than the goal. And it's just an incredibly impressive number. On small business, we had 29.5% participation in this to target by a half percent, but today we're going to talk a little bit more about the good work we're doing to advance equity. And we've trained over 16,000 individuals, which exceeded the goal by 10,000 individuals. So we absolutely are getting the word out. I think we are completely changed the DNA um, of our system here. So how can we uh, use this infrastructure to help us meet some of the critical policy objectives to strengthen our economy across a couple of different sectors, including advancing equity, uh, promoting environmental stewardship, um, building domestic markets and addressing supply chain risk management, cybersecurity, and the list goes on, right? So building this infrastructure has been incredibly important. And the president is very interested in using acquisition and leveraging this good work uh, to help set visions for some of these objectives that can help us move and in some cases build markets. So Matthew will talk in just a second 
about our efforts to advance equity in procurement and about our evolving work to attract and to retain uh, small disadvantaged businesses in federal contracting, including uh, efforts uh, through category management. I think it's an excellent example of how the small business community and category management communities have come together to support a common priority. Um, I think many of you are familiar with the president's management agenda. It's an important effort to focus senior level attention on a few critical work streams that can fundamentally change how we do business. And I think a lot of our category management success was built on the PMA framework uh, from earlier administrations. And as we take important steps towards defining the acquisition community's actions for the Biden-Harris uh, PMA, I think category management will again play a really important role as we strengthen our system to support our acquisition as a catalyst posture. But the system is vast, so how do we strengthen it? How do we build a resilient and diverse um, industry ecosystem? What kind of data should we collect and how do we use it? How do we consume it? How do we ready the workforce and attract the next generation? So these are all things that we're thinking about. Um, and we've got a lot to do collectively. We'll need input from our vendors, folks who are thinking about doing business with us, the workforce, potential workforce members, and many others whose perspective and experience is invaluable to us. So thank you again so much for being here. Matthew's going to do a deeper dive into our equity work, and we have a few polling questions because we're really interested in your feedback, and we'll get the conversation started. So Matthew. Thanks, Leslie. And um, as, as you know, um, advancing equity in procurement has been a top priority of this administration since day one of the administration. And last December, OMB issued a set of bold management reforms to embed equity principles into our everyday procurement practices and rebuild the supplier base that has eroded over the past decade, especially with respect to small businesses in our underserved communities. Um, these steps include a commitment to awarding at least 11% to small disadvantaged businesses this fiscal year on the way to 15% by fiscal 25, which we uh, believe will result in an additional $100 billion in spend to this community. Um, equally important, we've also updated how we provide credit for awards made in accordance with category management principles so that agencies receive credit for all awards made to socioeconomic small businesses, not just SDBs, but also women-owned small businesses, service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, and hub-zone contractors. So you'll get credit whether, the agency will get credit whether they're reached through existing contracts or on the open market, as will often be the case as agencies look to bring new entrants into the market. And a third related initiative is designed to bring those new entrants with a particular push to reach underserved communities. And to do this, we want to create tools to help agencies find new entrants and benchmark progress. So in terms of finding new entrants, we have found that there are many entities that register in SAM and don't get any work. And perhaps you are one of those companies. And this is just one example of a missed opportunity that we want to leverage. Um, in terms of measuring progress, we are working on a definition of new entrant and have received some very good input. Uh, just to give you a flavor of it, um, we want to be able to track both first-time entrants and re-entrants who haven't done business with us in a number of years, in a number of years, to send a signal to the community that we want to recapture some of the businesses that have fallen out of the market in recent years, where they have value to provide yeah. to our programs. And we also need to ensure that our attention on new entrants goes beyond the first award that brought them into the market. We need to treat them as new entrants for several years so agencies will continue to make efforts to help them get awards and establish their resiliency in our market. And we also wanna make sure that we're measuring uh, our, our progress in building diversity at both the government-wide level, how well are we doing at getting entities into our federal marketplace, and also at the agency level. And this measurement at the agency level is designed to recognize that there may be many SDBs and other underserved uh, small businesses already within the federal marketplace, maybe on government-wide vehicles that um, have are, are considered best in class in other government-wide vehicles. Uh, that are underutilized and, and could bring diversity if added to the agency's base. And finally, we are committed to upping our game in terms of the quality of procurement forecasts. Uh, we have heard from many contractors doing, during uh, outreach, both by OMB and by uh, agencies individually in developing procurement equity plans, that more timely and informative procurement forecast is very high on the wish list of our small business contractors who depend on this information to prepare more effectively for competition. Uh, and we're in the process of convening agency and industry representatives to identify best practices in three vectors. One is content, 
of successful forecast, what information is most important to you, uh, timing, want to make sure that you get it in a sufficient amount of time in advance so that you can prepare effectively for competition and plan, um, and also access. We want to make sure that the information is easy to access and that we are meeting you where you are. Um, and in that regard, uh, we have uh, created two uh, polling questions um, uh, because we want to take great advantage of um, the fact that you are all with us. We have such a great and diverse uh, body of folks here. So uh, the first, uh, we have two questions now, both for our industry participants. And there you can see them on the screen. The first is um, how important are agency procurement forecasts in your company's business development planning process? And we ask you to choose one of the following from one of the following critical, important, neutral, marginal, or not useful. So uh, I think should we wait a minute yeah. for the people and hopefully we'll see the answer come up. We're very interested. So if you're willing, please uh, jump in. Yeah. And I guess we can wait to see, will they, will this, to our colleagues, will the answers show up? There we are. Excellent. Well, good. Okay. So this is, this is a, an affirmation, a validation, Leslie, I think, yeah. of the yeah. fact that, you know, of all of the people participating, 90, essentially 90% are saying that it's critical yeah. or important. Yeah. Um, and so I think this is, this is helpful. This is what we've heard. Um, and uh, we know that, uh, for example, in the context of doing some solicitations and synopses, we have pretty uh, uh, specific information and business processes for what agencies are expected to do. And one of, I think, the, the questions here, the challenges is, you know, do we take the, the, uh, the, the current processes that we use for forecasting, which are much more open-ended, um, and, and try to tighten them up a little bit to bring greater consistency. Um, and that brings us to our second polling question, if we can put that one up for a second. Uh, so we need to scroll down. Okay. Here. Oh, there we go. Oh, they've already answered. Excellent. You guys are ahead of us. So this is great. We have a, we have a very good group. Uh, so most the, what's the most effective channel? So we see agency procurement forecasts, industry days. Um, one -on -one. Yep, one-on-ones. Yep, one-on-ones. And RFIs. Yes. We actually had one other, but is that the moment? Well, I think we're going to that one okay. later. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. There's a surprise coming later. So, so, no. uh, yes, yes. Excellent. Let's do that. that. That's incredibly helpful. I, and I, I you know the forecasting, I think, um, is certainly an area of focus. And I know that agencies are doing a lot on industry days and then the one on ones. It goes back to the Mythbusters campaign that, that um, you know, we've, we've run for quite some time. So that's really helpful information. That's great. So okay. thank you. Thank you all for that. Uh, we look forward to the other information. I think we had one more question related to the content and how important are agency procurement forecasts in your company's business development planning process. We asked that one. And then there was one more question, I believe, on what, what information in a forecast do you look for most frequently? And from project description, point of contact to answer questions, what's the date for the RFP release? Um, current contract number of the solicitation is a recompete um, and contract type. And I will just uh, uh, note that th those five those five data points: project description, point of contact, uh, release date, contract type, and and the contract number of the solicitation is recompete. This is what we have been received are the top five that uh, agencies uh, and I'm sorry that contractors that we've interviewed through industry associations to date have said are are most uh, relevant to them. So again, um, when you when that uh, when we do that survey tool, uh, would really uh, look forward to seeing what your response is uh, because we want we appreciate you taking the time to participate in this event, and I know we have a great cross section of of our, our contracting partners to to uh, which, which we want to be more engaged with, and and we know that uh, communications is number it's one. It's great. That's good. Yep. Thank you all so much for spending time with us today, and we'll turn it back. Uh, uh, to, the, to the folks running this for us. Thank you guys so much for that great keynote presentation. Next up, we have a session on using data to design small business strategies. We'll hear from Denise Benjamin Sermons, 
Director over in the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization within the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and Nigel Simon, Director in the Office of Program Management, and the Senior Information Official in the Office of Land and Emergency Management in the U.S. Environmental and Protection Agency. Denise and Nigel, please take it away. All right, greetings all. I am awaiting for our slides to be pulled up. So if anyone has those handy. That'll be good. And while we're waiting for the slides to come up, let me just let you all know how very honored I am actually to be included in today's uh, government-wide category management industry day. As a small business practitioner, I have to tell you guys that I really make it my business to participate in these events whenever they occur. And so you can imagine how delighted I am to have this opportunity to present along with my colleague. And let me just check in with him to see if he has the slides available. Nigel, do you have them? Yes, I have the slides. Hopefully everything works well. <laughs> All right, so you're bringing them up? I am bringing them up as we speak here. Hang awesome. On. All right, well, you're better at Zoom than I am, so I'll leave it in your capable hands. But um, while we wait for the slides, let me also just uh, give a quick shout out to LaVon, who is absolutely incredible. So I thank her very much for extending the invitation for EPA to present today. But I also want to thank LaVon because she's just been a tireless advocate and just been great to work with her leadership and personal engagement with our Ostaboos has been tremendous. So LaVon, thank you for your small business support, particularly within the context of category management. So yay, we have our slides. And so um, Nigel, if you, don't mind, <laughs> if you don't mind advancing to the next one, please. Okay, I think Marika has control of it. Uh, oh, okay. So. There we go. So this is who we are. Um, as previously mentioned, I'm Denise Sermons. I am with EPA, specifically the director of the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization for EPA, otherwise known as OSDABU. And I am really fortunate, and I got to tell you guys, I'm overjoyed that I'm joined with our program expert, uh, Nigel Simon. So we're going to be doing a little bit of a tag team here, so he'll get an opportunity to introduce himself in a second. But together, what Nigel and I will do, we'll talk a little bit about data-driven small business contracting strategies. Next slide. So what we plan to do to address, um, well, you know what, before, yeah, well, let me talk a little bit about what our objectives are, just to give you a sense of where we're going. Um, so we've kind of divided our presentation into three areas. Um, the first, we'll talk a little bit about what the data imperative is, why it's so important to have data to help drive our strategies and our small business contracting decisions. Wow. We'll then take a look at a little bit of the illustrations of, of how that data does actually drive our analysis. And then we'll finally take a look at the full blooming of the decision in the form of a comprehensive small business contracting strategy. So that's our approach. Uh, before we just kick things off, uh, I think it might be helpful for us to get a sense of who's in the audience and how familiar you are with um, EPA's contracting. There are a number of folks participating and we wanna know, are you familiar with what we do at EPA? So if we can pull up the full first polling question, please. And if you all would uh, kindly share your thoughts. Here we go. So our poll question number one, what type of engagement, if any, have you had with EPA contracting over let's say the last five years? And so please feel free to check as many of the options that are available that, are, that apply to you. So let's see how, who's in the audience and how familiar you all are with EPA. So we'll give folks a few minutes to complete their response, and then we'll take a look at the results. So whenever the results are ready, I know I'm anxious to see how it plays out. Hopefully some of you have engaged with EPA, if not my office, uh, some of the other program or contracting offices. 
So do we have the responses ready? Oh, not a lot with Ozdabu. I am sad. Hopefully by the end of this session, uh, you guys will connect with us. I see some have participated with, um, at least in our engagement activities. One has an EPA contract, yay, yay, yay. But the vast majority of you have no acquisition related engagement with EPA. So hopefully this session will change that. So thanks a lot. And to make sure that we're all on the same page, let's advance to the next slide. We have, as I said, Nigel Simon, who is our program expert. So he'll just give you a quick overview of the program that's really gonna be the subject of our conversation this afternoon. So Nigel, take it away. All right, thank you, Denise. Always a pleasure to work with you. And uh, certainly thank you for your advocacy for small business and businesses in related. So as mentioned, I am Nigel Simon. I serve as the director of the Office of Program Management and also the senior information official here in the Office of Land and Emergency Response. I think many of you uh, know EPA's mission, right? Which is to protect human health and the environment. And we fall under that. When you think of EPA, right? We have our water office, we have our air office, we have pesticides, and we have land and emergency response. We deal with cleanups and we also deal with emergency response as part of our mission um, to the American people. And, you know, it's a, we're one of the larger programs here in the agency. We do about a billion dollars annually in acquisition because we couldn't do this important cleanup work without our agency partners, our other federal agency partners, but also uh, businesses. You know, a number, we work with a number of contractors um, to help us with the cleanup um, across the United States. You know, we also work with states, with tribes, um, with academia. Um, so there's a lot involved when we talk about what you see on the screen. When we talk about, yes, our primary function is emergency response. So when you think of hurricanes and wildfires and trail derailments, that's us, right? And sometimes it may involve Coast Guard. Sometimes it may involve FEMA. Um, but a lot of times when you hear of an emergency response or a natural disaster, our folks, what we call our on-scene coordinators and our environmental response team, they're on the ground assisting, right? So that's a lot of our primary function, but we also do cleanups of uh, hazardous waste sites, underground storage tanks. When you think about, for example, uh, gasoline stations, all those underground storage tanks that are associated with gas stations, we are also responsible for the regulations associated with them. I have a bit of uh, statistics to help you here, right? That 53% of the US population lives within three miles of one of our cleanup sites. That's to tell you the enormous um, size of the amount of cleanups that we work across the United States, right? We have 10 regional offices. So we cover all parts, the, um, including the US mainland and our US territories. And a lot of our sites are very close um, to Denise's point earlier. So when we talk about cleanups, we go across, right? We provide technical assistance and we work with all levels of government, as I mentioned, state, local, tribal, um, to help with whether it's waste prevention, reuse and recycling, disposable um, type practices. So what what we look for in procurement services across the gamut, not only the emergency response, but folks just to help us, help us spread the word about environmental protection, particularly the cleanup of our soil, residential, commercial areas. And um, a lot of our programs are geared to that. So you will see a number of times when you do see EPA, EPA personnel, it's folks from the Office of Land and Emergency Management that are there responding. Um, so, and the last point I wanted to make on this bullet was, I mean, on this last bullet here, was about the innovative technologies. We know academia and private industry, there's a lot of research in talking about how can we do things differently? How can we make it more effective and sometimes cheaper? Um, so we rely on a lot of the research that's coming out of industry and academia to help us in terms of the tools to help with emergency response, soil cleanup, 
um, waste prevention, um, and the like. All right, so that's, that's basically a snapshot of what we do here at Olam. We call ourselves the Mighty Olam because of the breadth of our program and the amount of things that we do um, type thing. So Denise, back over to you. Sounds great. Thank you so much. So let's move on to slide five as we drill a little deeper for purposes of our conversation this afternoon. So really what we're gonna be focusing is a specific subset of the work that Nigel just described to you, specifically the remedial cleanup work, which is an important work and really impacts all of our communities and really has opportunities for small businesses, which is one of the primary reasons we're showcasing this particular strategy. So there is currently an acquisition solution for our remedial acquisitions. And a lot of hard work went into creating this strategy, which is referred to at EPA as the remedial acquisition framework. You'll sometimes hear folks refer to the RAC, which is what this is. And all of the hard work actually predated my tenure here, here in Osdebu. Um, but what it essentially consists of is three existing multiple award contracts. And so they're reflected in the big boxes, DES, RES, and ISO, and they basically reflect the range of work under the remedial acquisition framework. But in addition to these existing suite of contracts, we have other vehicles in our toolbox, and they're reflected on the right-hand side in green. So they include independent contracts, what's referred to as site-specific contracts, they also include us using servicing agencies to process our awards, such as the Corps of Engineers. And then we have some leg legacy contracts that are available to us. But what I, the point I really wanna make with respect to these contracts and this work is not only is it important to communities as Nigel mentioned, it's also important to us as a small business office because of the opportunities that it provides for small businesses. But more than that, under bill, this particular segment of work stands to receive and has received $3.5 billion. And um, that's actually more than twice of EPA's annual contract spend. And so there's a lot of work that's gonna be done here, a lot of dollars. And we as an Osdebu office are focusing on how we can leverage these dollars so small, but particularly socioeconomic businesses get a share and piece of the pie. And that's what we're gonna talk about this afternoon. Next slide, please. All right, so the big question is data. We have a strategy that we're trying to come up with for this line of work. And why is data important in driving and helping us develop that strategy? Well, the data imperative for EPA is really simple. The bottom line is this stuff is tough. It's complicated and it's hard. We have a myriad of requirements in the contracting area. We have lots of goals, we have lots of priorities, and of course we have the mission objectives that we have to achieve, right? So it really creates a lot of balls in the air for contracting officials and really the entire acquisition of workforce to include the programs, the Osdeboos and the actual contracting officers. And so on the left side of this slide, you'll see the balls all percolating up and then they kind of distill and combine through the acquisition funnel. And for us, quite frankly, they come out as a little bit of a contracting quagmire. And just to highlight some of the considerations that we're considering, we know in the small business world that we have that statutory mandate to maximize small business contracting opportunities. And it really uses the terminology, the maximum practicable opportunities. But on top of that, there is the legal requirement that we should be prioritizing socioeconomic categories over Great. small businesses generally. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I saw a couple of lights come on. But on top of that, we have some executive priorities and both Leslie and, um, and Matt referenced, Matthew referenced some of, the, some of those with the current administration and the real push to ensure that we're providing support to underserved communities. And so we're seeing that in the man, president's management agenda. We're also seeing that in all of the executive orders. And so we have to be considerate about all those things. And then of course, there are the other contracting requirements. 
There are other priorities, ability one, domestic sourcing, category management, the list goes on and on. So data is really important to leverage to help us sort through all of this so that we are strategically applying those requirements to our, achieve our intended outcomes that we're seeking. Next slide, please. All right, so to sort through all of this, we have a little bit of a methodology that we utilize at EPA. So we're calling it here, our decision calculus. And it's comprised of considerations that we take into account and they kind of fit into these four buckets for convenience of discussion. So the first one is overarching, really important, the mission needs. Now that particular consideration is not as much based on the data, but certainly the three remaining ones are, so they are the availability of small and socioeconomic businesses. What is the status of goal achievements? We're looking at data there. And also what are the tools and the resources that we can utilize to really streamline and simplify all of this? So I'm gonna take a quick dive into each of these considerations to give you a flavor of what we do. And so the objective here is to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit so you can get a sense of what our methodology and approach is so that um, you can help inform your own marketing and other efforts to do business with EPA and certainly some other federal agencies. All right, so let's move on to the next slide, looking at mission needs first. So here's the deal with mission needs, um, with mission objectives. The, the first thing is for EPA, mission is overarching and it's foundational. We as an agency work as one EPA, Osdebu included, to make sure we're achieving the mission of the agency to what, as uh, Nigel said, to protect human health and the environment. Now there's sub goals for each of the program offices that feed into that mission, but we have to be really careful as Osdebu that we're keeping that mission front and center. And what we seek to do is to provide the small business expertise and the value added services to help the offices identify what those small business sources and solutions are to meet their program needs. But without making that nexus, it really is hard to convince programs that they should just utilize a small business because they're available or because there's a goal. They're really focused on the mission. So the question for them is how is this gonna help further my own mission. And in the case of remedial acquisitions, and we do this for all of the programs, we look to see what the synergies are and the interoperability to the extent they are so that we can really base our strategy on that. And for the remedial acquisition, this is a community-based program. They're really trying to revitalize, rebuild and energize these communities. And so that really fits perfectly with our socioeconomic goals and programs, particularly for hubs, hub zone, which we know focuses on community vitalization. And the other thing that I want to, to just note as we're looking at these different considerations in the decision calculus is that we are not making our recommendations for small business strategies in a vacuum. We're really recognizing the importance of the decisions being based on very deliberate, calculated, and thoughtful strategies. And for me, that's really what's at the heart of category management to make sure that as we conduct and analyze and pursue the contract spend that we're really being good stewards with the taxpayer dollars. And that's kind of what this methodology is designed to do. So for remedial acquisition, we know we have perfect mission objectives for socioeconomic programs. Let's move on to the next decision calculus real quickly. So this is about the availability of small businesses. So yeah, we make a convincing argument to the programs that this utilizing these small business contracting programs is gonna help your mission, but they're gonna to wanna to know, well, are there small businesses that are capable and qualified to do the work so that we can actually in reality achieve that mission objective, making sure that the work gets done. And so that's the first thing that we do as, as part of our market research is identify what are the small businesses that are out there? And so what we do focusing on the data is we take a look at the North Amer uh, North, the NAICS, the North American Industry Classification Codes for the work that's being the subject of analysis. And then we look to see what the businesses are that's out there. 
And this is an example of what we did with respect to the remedial acquisition work. And what we found was there was an incredibly robust pool of apparently capable socioeconomic businesses in the industry of the remedial work. But more than that, not only were there a lot in numbers, but when you look at the, the table below on the right-hand side, they really span all of the socioeconomic categories, right? So lots of numbers, diversity in the type of socioeconomic businesses. And so that's really appealing as we look to, to expand the supplier base for the agency. Next slide, please. Now, because we're focusing on HubZone, as I mentioned earlier, because of its intersection with this meridi uh, the remedial work, so we, we did a little bit more to look to see where the hub zones are with respect to the United States. Are they lo located throughout the United States? Because that's where a lot of these cleanup sites will be. And so as you see, they're everywhere. So that really strengthens our hand in developing a strategy and convincing the program office to go with it. Now, just a quick word on the data. So ordinarily, we use a range of data to include the dynamic small business search, which is authoritative in, with respect to the socioeconomic um, category of the businesses. We also use the D2D GSA tool that's kind of helpful in, in looking at a number of different things. But this time, we relied on what we consider to be a really important partner. And that was the HubZone Contractors National Council. And so we worked with them and they actually pulled together some great data for us to get a better sense of what and who these HubZone firms are and where they're located. So this is an example where we look to our other partners in industry, you know, small business associations to help us because they have that expertise in the particular category of small businesses that we're looking at. Next slide. All right, so we're moving on to the third calculus real quickly. So we know that we have a program that has tremendous alignment with our socioeconomic goals. We also know that there are a lot of socioeconomic firms that are out there. The question now is, well, how does that line up with where the agency is in terms of its status and progress in achieving its goals? And we look at that both on the EPA wide level and we also look at the program specific level. And as you see in the data reflected here, EPA wide, there's some pockets of issues over the years. Some years we do better in some categories than others. But when you drill down to the program, which is here, the Office of Land and Emergency Response, you see that we're kind of performing, sorry, Nigel, but pretty miserably with respect to the socioeconomic category. So we know that this is where we need to focus their attention, not so much on small businesses, because they're doing reasonably well, or even STDs, they're doing reasonably well there, but it's the women-owned, the hub zone, and the service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses. And in terms of the data, what we rely on here is not so much the SAM.gov and the FPDS, which feeds information to SAM.gov, but, and also D2D, really it's here that we use D2D, not so much with the identification of the firms, but what we find here is that we have our own dashboard that Ozdebu issued a few years ago that really breaks down achievements based on our program office. And that's really what's the most helpful for us because it provides the visibility and transparency that we need. Okay, I see I'm growing short on time. So I'm gonna to move to the last calculus. And that's the tools and the resources. Now for me, um, this too is very important. Why? Because the easier we make small business contracting, the more likely it is that the programs and the contracting officials will utilize it. So contracting officers are really busy. They have a lot of discretion, broad discretion in structuring their acquisitions, but if it takes too much time, they're not gonna be able to pay attention to it. And so we really work hard to find the tools that will enable them to structure these, these procurements to maximize the small business opportunity in the easiest way. And so the, one of the biggest things we did was um, overlay a hub zone map with a tool that was already available in Olam. And so I don't know that uh, Nigel is gonna be able to demo it because I know he was planning on doing that, but I'm gonna give him an opportunity to share what this means. And then we'll have a polling question at the end 
to find out from you all how helpful you believe this will be, not only to us, because we think it's helpful to us, but is it going to be a tool that you all can utilize as well? Nigel, I'll, I'll turn it over right. to you. All right. Thanks, Denise. And, you know, just, uh, of course, Murphy would raise his ugly head today uh, because when we were practicing on the link earlier, you can go to the page, but it's not giving you the data that you can necessarily kind of manipulate and navigate through. So I'm going to walk through it, but I also provided a link in the chat to the cleanups in my community. So what cleanups in my community, what it does, it stores to Denise's point of data. All of our cleanup data, you can list. So Nigel, I just wanted to interrupt for one quick second. I'm so sorry because I was, um, I overwent on my time. So forgive me. So I know we don't have a lot of time. So just giving you a time check. Thanks. Thanks. No, no, that's fine. Um, so what the cleanups in my community does, you can put in your street address, you can put in your zip code, and it will tell you what kind of action EPA has going on in your particular area. What I mentioned earlier, that statistic, about 53% of the U.S. population lives within three mile, a three mile radius of our cleanup sites. This is the site that provides that for you. And as part of Olam and our opportunity to do better in terms of our numbers that Denise highlighted, we, we started to do two things. Um, about six years ago, we started having a, um, a, a biennial industry day event where we were trying to do more to attract not only hub zone and service disabled businesses, but women owned businesses. We realized a lot of our cleanup requirements were large because we were dealing with a lot, a number of large prime contractors, but we were trying to, and we still are trying to work and see how can we break that up to make it that we can attract more service disabled, women-owned, hub zone. The one thing um, some members of my staff work with the Small Business Administration was to get those hub zones and where they are located and basically um, put it on top of where we have our cleanups in my community data. And the one community I was going to demo today was uh, East Chicago, Indiana. It's a residential community. Um, mainly uh, people of color, um, but there were a number of issues. It was built on a former lead smelter site. So there are a number of environmental issues. We have been doing cleanups on there for a number of years. So I wanted to show you that where that East Indiana cleanup data is, but also the opportunities for hub zones. Because we, we try to do a great job of not only going into communities and doing a cleanup, but are there opportunities to hire people from the community to be part of that cleanup, right? When, when uh, Denise mentioned about Superfund Remedial and our cleanup efforts, that's one of the things that we're trying to do. And we are working to improve our hub zone numbers. And we think this tool will help us with when we're doing our acquisition forecast of the work that we're predicting for the next two or three years, because we look at our contracts and see which ones are about to expire and set to expire. And we look at it and say, hey, can we break up some of the requirements on this to get to some of those hub zone or service disabled or women owned uh, businesses? So that's, that's it in a nutshell, just to keep in the interest of time, some of the things we are doing. Hopefully this fall we'll have our industry day event. We had the last one in 2000 and is in virtual, but in prior years, it used to be in person where you could meet a number of our um, offices, and you can you can talk about the specific work, whether it's in soil analysis, sample analysis, actual cleanup in that community. So we have a number of uh, services that we offer as part of those remediation services, and as well as emergency response. And that's it, uh, Denise. I'll turn it back to you. Oh, you're on mute, Denise. Yeah, I, I was saying that was awesome. I have to follow your example and being very brief and succinct. So forgive me if I stole some of your time. So no, we won't good. pull up the polling question, but I appreciate that Nigel put the link in the chat. So I encourage you all to take a look at that and see if it's helpful to you. So the bottom line is essentially that um, we have a great strategy. It's comprehensive and we think it's gonna provide a lot of opportunities for small businesses. And it really is based on the data which is really what is engendering and fostering the buy-in from the, both the program and the contracting officials. 
So once you get the slide, you'll see on the very last slide, there's some resources um, for you all. Um, if we can move it to the last slide, I believe it's 15. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at those resources for those of you that are interested in learning more about um, doing business with EPA. Uh, I'll highlight for you real quickly our small business vendor database system, which is a, a new system that we launched. So for businesses that are ready, willing, and able to work with um, EPA, please go ahead and register on that to receive automated uh, notices. We also have a brand new consolidated vendor engagement calendar. So that's the link to it. Take a look at it there and you'll see what um, opportunities are coming up for other engagements, including a reverse industry day that we're planning on this uh, type of work as well as others. So listen, it's our time of 145. I wanna thank you guys so much again for the opportunity to chat with you. I hope this was helpful. And if nothing else sparked and piqued your interest to reach out to us, we're happy to share more information with you all. Thanks so much. And back to you. I believe it's Alyssa or I'm not sure. Oh, yes, it is me. Um, I will put up your last and final poll question so everyone can answer it. Um, so while I'm introducing the next um, session, please feel free to answer that. And the question is just if you think that the hub zone and cleanup maps that um, Nigel provided the link might be helpful to you all. Um, and this will be helpful in knowing for us and how we can refine and continue to promote it. Thank you all again. Yes, thank you, Denise and Nigel. That was a great presentation and demo. We're now going to move on to our IT category panel, strategies for small business success in IT. Um, this panel is going to be moderated by Laura Stanton, the Assistant Commissioner um, in the Office of Information. Um, in the technology category, Federal Acquisition Service within um, the General Services Administration, government-wide IT category manager. Um, oh, hey, I, hey, Alyssa, thank you. Yeah, no you worries. Um, I wasn't sure if you were gonna do the other three or not, but I am happy to take it from here. Okay, yeah, no worries. I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful. All right, thank you so much um, for the invitation today from ATARC and for being able to join all of you in the Small Business Industry Day and looking at category management really being a team sport. And with that in mind, I thought that the best way to be joined today is by three of the other IT um, best in class solutions managers. And let me go ahead and introduce, start out by um, introducing them. And then I have a couple of things. I just wanna give you an overview on the IT category before we get into some questions for the panel. So with that, Cheryl, I, would, I am thrilled to be joined by Cheryl Cameron, Thornton Cameron, who is the executive director of the multiple awards um, schedule for IT and the, also the acquisitions um, operations executive director in the IT category at GSA um, by Darlene Cohen, who is the deputy director at uh, NASA Soup, and by Ricky Clark, who is the deputy director at the National Institutes of Health um, Information Technology Acquisition and Assessment Center. So one of the things that we really wanted to be able to do in this session is talk about the different activities and the different strategies that each of our programs is taking on. Um, because the IT government-wide category, our goal is to, is to strengthen the federal supply chain by mitigating vendor concentration through the use of small businesses. And with a special emphasis on small disadvantaged businesses and emerging technologies. Just to give you a sense of the scope, across the government, it is, the IT category is the fourth largest category with last year with $70.7 .7 billion in total obligations for FY21. And it includes 13 best in class contracts, which is the largest out of any of the government wide categories and represents approximately 30% of the total best in class solutions in category management. So, that gives you an idea of just the scope, the amount of money going through this. Um, 
And within the category, IT services is the largest subcategory within that. It has 62% of that $70 billion. And what we're doing across the board in this category is an increased emphasis on small business participation um, and be advancing equity, diversity, and inclusiveness for the federal marketplace. And that's, that's what our, our panelists are going to take the time to talk about today. Um, we, we heard Matt, Leslie and Matthew set the stage by talking about the uh, talking about um, OMB M2203, which is uh, the policy on really utilizing the government's buying to support small businesses and, and um, supporting equity. And that the, this launches the action plan to increase spending um, by over $100 billion over the next five years to these small disadvantaged businesses. Um, so what we're doing, some of the things that we're doing and that we've seen real progress on is in the IT category is that small business utilization in the past several years has gone from 34.7% in FY18 to 37.8% in FY21. What that means in real dollars to each of you is that $4.3 billion more went to small businesses during this period of time. And um, we have some, and one of our programs even has the utilization is as high as 82%. But we also see some barriers. And that's one of the reasons why I'm excited to be here with you today is that as we're seeing increased dollars going to small businesses, we're also seeing fewer small businesses generally as prime contractors. And these decreasing number of small businesses is part of a government-wide trend. Um, we saw a, dro the, a drop of 24% of small businesses winning prime IT contracts from FY18 to FY21. And at the same time, we also saw the small business entrance decline by 70%. Mm -hmm. So that would be the new small business entrance. So I'm, I'm hitting on these numbers to show you that while we're seeing a success on the increased dollars, we do want to see more small business entrants. We want to understand how to work with small disadvantaged businesses. And this has been a true emphasis of this category. And I think you're going to hear that very clearly from our, from our panelists today about the work that they're doing inside of their organizations to make this happen. So with that, I will stop talking and let me start asking some questions and hearing, hearing from our panelists. So um, Cheryl, you were up first. And can you uh, talk us through some of the things that the General Services Administration and specifically the IT category are doing to bring more small business IT vendors into the federal marketplace? Yes, I can. And thank you, Laura. Um, GSA, at GSA, we're very proud of the close partnerships that we've had with our small business vendors. Um, what I would like to say is that we have a moratorium in effect. Uh, I wanna start there, that all small businesses who for whatever reasons have not been able to generate any sales, we will continue to work with them. And so uh, I wanna make sure that I say that up front. Uh, small businesses make up roughly 80% of our vendor pool, and they come from all across the country and with many socioeconomic statuses. So we've done a number of things to bring in more small businesses and make it easier for them to participate in a federal marketplace. I talk about uh, just three of them. The first thing we did was establish the start of springboard program within the multiple award schedules contracts, which gave small business vendors with less than two years of experience an alternative path to proving that they were financially responsible and could perform on our contracts. Uh, prior to this change, small businesses with less than two years of experience were not allowed to get on a mass contract. Hmm. Uh, since the inception of this program, We've awarded over 200 mass contracts to vendors with less than two years of experience and 
So far to date, they have generated over $200 million in business volume. The second thing we've done is in our GWAC space, we had in a recent uh, STARS Three Award, which is an 8A award. We have to date awarded over 1,000 vendors and we're still working to get more of our small disadvantaged businesses awarded. And of course, we're currently going through our Polaris GWAC acquisition, which is focused on small businesses as well. Unfortunately, uh, because we are still in the acquisition process, that's all I, I can say for now. But in all cases, uh, we have done extensive outreach to small business community to spread the word about these opportunities. On the horizon, we also have other uh, GWAC and mass vehicles that we are currently work on, uh, working on to get in place, which will give small businesses even a greater opportunity to get into the federal marketplace. <laughs> Finally, the last thing that we are doing is we're hosting training webinars and online workshops for small businesses to be able to join our mass program. And those events occur regularly and they are very well attended. So that's how we're trying to get more businesses into the federal marketplace. Back to you, Laura. Fantastic. Thank you, Cheryl. And let me jump over to Darlene, who is the Deputy Director of NASA Soup. Um, and Darlene, how does the government include and capture small businesses throughout the entire supply chain process and procurement, rather than primarily just as value-added resellers or subcontractors in specific areas? So, um, let me pass it over to you to hear how, how, how Soup makes that happen. Well, and thanks, Lara. Um, that's a great question. And, and as you know, the entire government is trying to figure out how do we do, you know, how do we handle supply chain the best way and what can be done? And so one thing I would say is, um, you know, our program director has been in the open group board for many years now, who is was a, a major entity in the supply chain uh, risk management arena. And so one thing we're currently doing is we, we have, I guess you call them flags within our tool system where we are verifying those folks who are in fact either certified through that open group um, organization following the NIST standards and, and all the other standards that go through that. But I think the, the main role that, that, to be clear, that Soup plays in that is that we verify and provide that information, right? So we're not there working um, those issues, but we do show our contract holders, we show industry how you can join with some of these organizations in order to get some certifications or information regarding that process, which of course, as it becomes more full force throughout the government, um, that might be something that I, I would recommend industry start reaching out to do just to get some information on it, find out what it is. Uh, and again, um, the verification and I'll guess management and then the posting within our system for those who are currently in that uh, is available as we speak. And we hope that we can keep adding more uh, prime contractors and also the subs and the teaming partners that come through the contract on a continual basis that we're training them as well, just so that we're more prepared to, to uh, address that as customers have those needs. Thank you, Darlene. And I think, and, and I have questions, and I love the fact that you're talking about some training and how to introduce some of these new requirements to, the, to our small business community. Um, and, and I actually, and I want to expand that question a little bit to go to and, and take it over to Ricky, which is um, what are, you know, as I know that you have been hard at work on getting CIOSP4 up and running, Ricky. And so once a, a, once a small business gets a contract on there, what are the best ways to be successful um, once they get that award? So they're, they're all ready to hit the ground running. 
Well, thank you, Laura, and that's very insightful. We are very hard at work trying to make sure that SB4 is uh, put forward. I think, um, first and foremost, let me say this. I, I think at NITAC, we've always, always been a partner to small business. So that's kind of our, our niche, if you will. We, we, we like to uh, consider ourselves partnered with the uh, small business community. In fact, I think it was the NITAC vehicle, the NITAC GWAC, that was the first to have the small business as a separate set-aside award and category. So what we're doing to be um, helpful for the SP4 is uh, the first thing you want to do is uh, we try and engage the contract holder and teach them how to market themselves. There's no one that can tell a story better than the small business themselves. So it's very, very important if you're on any ZWAC, but it's specifically we're talking about SB4, for you to learn how to market yourself. You want to come in, you want to develop a strategy, know what the mission is, uh, find out what the NITAC mission is, and then find some commonalities, ways to, uh, you know, to, to time in, so to speak. Uh, you want to develop targets and timetables. We work with them to do that. We have industry days. We're constantly, uh, you know, having a back and forth meeting with the, even a potential contractor, but after they're onboarded, then our process is to, uh, to engage them to make sure that they understand what our mission is, to make sure that they clearly understand uh, who our agency customer is, and then teach them to market themselves. I think uh, Darlene just spoke a lot about uh, partnership agreements. So when you're coming in for SP4, uh, getting the contract is just step one. So it goes back to marketing, and I think you can't overstate that. You want to learn to market your capabilities, find out what your capabilities are, and then you go out and you look for mentors, look for partnership arrangements. In the federal government, you have to be attentive to uh, the needs of the federal government. Uh, so you also want to partner with uh, OSTABU. You want to partner with the Small Business Program so you understand the trends. You want to also go out and do some additional work, you know, checking the USA spending, uh, FPDS, to make sure that you're aware of what agencies are buying, uh, when they're buying, and what the upcoming trends are. So I think uh, the biggest part for us, or biggest part for me, I'd say that Besides knowing who you are, besides knowing what your companies are, learn how to market yourself, you know, be engaged with the federal marketplace. Because as a small business, you have two advantages. Once you can market yourself to the federal government, you can also market yourself to other prime contractors for attainment arrangements. So I think that's the biggest piece. And I think that should be a, a, an area of focus. Learn to market yourself. Thank Great. you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. And I think that there is that that is so key. And I think attending sessions like this and learning how to understand the federal acquisition world and the community is is such an important part because it is complicated. And um, but I also want and I but um, and I always think about one of the things the way that I think about it is it's getting not only once you it's getting in the door getting getting a multiple award scheduler getting a GWAC and then the second half is getting the business yes. and that's where you're talking about the marketing yourself yes so wonderful thank you and let me take it back to Cheryl and talk exactly about that which is GSA has a number of IT vendors already on the multiple awards schedule as well as the government wide acquisition contracts and what are you doing over at GSA, Cheryl, to help those companies be more successful? Thank you for that question, Laura. For vendors who are already on our contracts, first of all, we're listening, we're learning, and we're taking action to help them be successful. Uh, the GWACs have a fairly rigorous setup with the twice a year program management reviews where we meet with our industry partners and provide them with resources and training to help them to be more successful. But we also do a lot of listening to ensure that we are removing unnecessary barriers to their success. On the mass side of the house, we have launched a number of initiatives to not only improve the vendor experience, but also to help them be more successful. We're currently taking a look at our onboarding process for vendors after they receive an award. We want to make sure that they fully understand their contracts and get acclimated with the federal acquisition environment as quickly as possible. We are also looking at rolling out new training for vendors to better market themselves to federal and civilian agencies. Overall, uh, we're also focusing on marketing our GSA vehicles to our customer agencies and forming more strategic, uh, strategic partnerships within those agencies so that we can grow the collective pool of opportunities for all small businesses. Uh, 
We are also in the process of establishing a supply diversity plan that promotes successful outcomes for vendors, including the strategy and criteria for our regular on-ramping relative to our GWACs and our MAC uh, acquisition vehicles. Uh, we already have a number of strategic partnerships with agencies such as uh, DOD, HHS, Treasury, and the Air Force, but we are looking to have more strategic partnerships with more agencies, and this will drive more spending through our vehicles, and small businesses will benefit as a result. Thank you for the question, Laura. Thank you, Cheryl. And I think that that's, that's really important. It's a, it's a multi-pronged, it's learning, it's companies learning sort of how to present themselves. But um, I heard you loud and clear, uh, Cheryl, that at GSA, you are certainly focused on making those connections with agencies and helping them understand the value as well. Darlene, um, I wanted to come to you on all the work that you've been doing over at NASA Soup around how the government can work with small business vendors to assist them in expanding their footprint for government requirements. Because it's not, it's also, they're looking to mature and grow. And so how, can you talk me through sort of what are some of the things that you're up to? Well, sure. And, you know, that's a great question. And I think all of the, the panelists have, have mentioned great avenues, plans, things they're trying, uh, the engagement with industry. I think we've all sort of have the, the same advice of what's your business model um, for a company based on possibly a familiar business model for someone who is a prime. So what I would say is sometimes we're looking at doing business with the government as a prime contractor. And I understand everyone wants a prime contract, but sometimes for these companies that are very small, have never done business with the government, want to get their footprint in some way um, to take advantage of any, um, I'll say formal teaming or subcontracting, but I'd say on NASA Soup, we had uh, vendors every day, whether it's as a provider or teaming partner or subcontractor. And, and it's very fluid where we don't have formal on-ramps. But when a solicitation is posted and the government has a requirement, any of our prime contract holders can team with anyone behind the scenes as a sub or teaming partner. And so it's a perfect opportunity for those of you online who, um, might have that capability to be able to support one of those requirements. And so the best advice is to really look at the prime contractors that are on contract, reach out to them and say, and introduce yourselves to them um, so that they can have you in mind when they're getting these requirements. Because we do about 40,000 uh, solicitations per year. So there's plenty of opportunity but it's developing that relationship really with the prime contract holders. And I think another big thing is, you know, the government is normally post solicitations with that requirement that you have to have past performance for so many years or so many dollars um, and those kind of things. But uh, I think trying to be innovative with maybe pieces of that requirement where we do not require, say, those teaming partners or subs for that requirement to have past performance. And we've tried that on a few where we give that risk to the prime contractor through vetting. And, and so I think there is lots of ways to get involved. And I think each of these programs representative represented here has great things going on. But I would just echo uh, Ricky and Cheryl and say the main thing is take that initiative reach out to our, you know, any of these agencies here, and we can certainly take you down the road to those next steps so that you can either get experience as not a prime or be able to, to get that experience so you can bid as a prime in the future. Because as you know, there is a mandate to solicit small business as much as possible, but there's also a reality that there are some requirements that possibly just can't be done 
Uh, and so to be able to have a relationship maybe with a large business or those folks would be a, a huge advantage for your company. But thank you. Great, Darlene. Thank you so much. So I'm hearing that one of the ways to do it is go get out, meet, do some matchmaking events, meet some meets other companies and, and figure out and look at complementary opportunities. Yes. Um, Yes. So, and so thank you. I think that's incredibly practical and good advice. Um, Ricky, I wanted to come back to you. And there was a question in the chat that I wanted to give you a chance to answer, as well as um, ask you another question sort of along these lines. Okay. The question in the chat is asking for a bit more information on CIO SP4. Um, can you give a, just a, a, a quick uh, sentence or two overview on that? Uh, I can, and now because it is an active procurement, it's still is still stated, so I'm limited, but I will say this. Uh, we are currently working the offers. We are working our proposals. We plan to have this awarded by November 1st of uh, this year, 2020. So um, with that being said, uh, it is the, the predecessor to SP3. We are hoping to improve on the success of the SP3 vehicle, and we're very excited about the opportunity for offering this to our industry. Cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I think that the next question is actually a great sort of follow-on question from that I want that I really want to know is so a small business, if they might not be on a best-in-class contract, but they want to receive work through a best-in-class GWAC, what steps should they take to be doing that? I'll answer that in two parts. The first question is if you're a small business and you did um submit our offer or proposal uh, for the SP4 in, in the event that you're not contacted, first thing I would recommend you doing is find out why you weren't successful. There is no success without failure. So it, what I would do is uh, make sure you ask for the debriefs, uh, take an opportunity to, if you could, to partner with folks that were similarly situated but were successful. That way you can learn from their lessons as well. Um, now, as far as not being a part of the uh, solicitation process and wanting to be on, there's a enormous amount of opportunities. Uh, at NITAC, when we uh, award the contract, say SP4, for instance, after it's awarded within 30 days, that the prime contract holder is required to have a public facing website, but the website has a URL. So I would encourage any small business that wants to do business with NITAC or NITAC Prime to go out and, you know, go to the website, uh, do some research goes back to what I said earlier about marketing yourself. So market yourself, find out what these companies are, find out what their skill set is and find out how you can be complimentary with their skill set. It also goes back to what I'm saying, knowing exactly what you, you know you're worth, know exactly what your capabilities are and be able to uh, adequately present those to industries. So the, um, the strange thing about business, uh, business opportunities are not always uh, what you expect them to be, but you have to be ready to address them uh, when the opportunity becomes available. So those opportunities are, you know, based on trends. Opportunities may be based on an executive, um, an executive mandate. So as a small business, I would, uh, what I think Cheryl just said this as well as Darlene, you know, look for partnership opportunities. Uh, reach out and make yourself visible. Make sure you. Um, Pick industry days. I'm being a small business. I wouldn't say, you know, take an industry day that's across the country. You know, start local first. Uh, find out local contacts you can make. Uh, go to industry days that are virtual. That way you keep your costs low. I'm being a prior uh, small business owner myself. I understand that cost is always paramount. You don't always have the resources, but you do have the flexibility and you do have the innovation. So that is what the government is looking for. So you would also want to, you know, reach out to, as I said, to uh, some of the uh, prime contract holders. See if you can offer a service for them. I recommend you keep your skills sharp and relevant. Uh, find out what's going on in the industry, whether you're developing support for cloud computing, shared services, uh, data center consolidation, agile development, uh, artificial intelligence. Always look for opportunities. And if you don't have that skill set, you want to go out and find ways to develop that skill set. So, so as opposed to what Darlene was saying, we will be doing an on that because, you know, the small business community has asked for it. So once SP4 is awarded, I guarantee there'll be an on ramp for some of the small businesses as our small businesses who are on the uh, on the uh, GWAC, uh, they graduate. So we have to replace those. So if you're not successful the first time around, I would strongly encourage you to address some of the opportunities and be prepared uh, when the on when the ramp on comes around, you may be successful the second time around. It is a continuous circle of improvement and you always wanna keep your skills relevant and always look for ways to improve. 
Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Ricky. And I, I just want to do a quick follow on that. that sure. some, and because this, this goes to some of the questions we'll be getting in the chat. Okay. And um, that there's concerns about from the small business community that category management and best in class favor large businesses. And I think you, you've you talked about this, but um, what, do you, what do, do you have further advice to small businesses around this area? Because it's, so, you know, it's deep you, and, and you we you're we're sharing all of the things that we're working on to help sure. this community Jen. Uh, not to go against the grain but i think that's an oxymoron uh, uh when it comes to gwax uh for nitac for instance over 75 percent of our contract holders are small businesses and category management is sort of um finding ways to be more cost effective finding ways uh, and solutions that address the need well the need of the federal government is to have small businesses we have a socioeconomic mandate so what we want to do is increase it i know about the other industries but at nih our goal is just increased about five percent so that would be uh, totally contrary to what you're saying so for us that would be a zero-sum game so we want to include the small business so we look for ways to um get you involved. We look for ways to uh, have you go out and partner. That's the main reason that we have those public facing websites. So those small businesses have an avenue. We know rather than saying go to an industry where actually you could just log on, sit at home, go to nitech.gov and look for opportunities with prime contractors. I think that um, with small businesses, there is no golden ticket. I think it's the effort. It goes back to what I said initially, and I think it can be overstated that you have to learn to market yourself. Uh, the granularity of the uh, uh, category management process is, and it looks at categories, it looks at subcategories, but each are focused on finding ways to be more efficient, to bring on board small businesses. It's not to exclude them, it's to include them. So in order for you to be included, then you have to have a skill set that's beneficial. And if you don't have that skill set, you have an opportunity now to go out and you know do an MPA, uh, go out and do some subcontracting, maybe even a joint venture. That way, you can get yourself in the game. So that's the biggest portion. My biggest advice would be, um, you know, get in the game. If it's something that you're missing, find ways to develop that skill set because uh, vehicles, the uh, GWAX in general, especially NITAC, we're always looking for that. I mean, you, there's no price you can pay for innovation. There's no price you can pay for being agile. And those two facts definitely come from the small business community. And that's an integral part of what we do. Uh, on a daily basis, we have increased dollars that are obligated for small businesses. Well, the number of uh, small business transactions for us are going up. There's an uptick in all business, small business categories without fail across the board. So what we want to do is to include the small business, but in order to be included, then you want to uh, make sure that you have a skill set that's relevant. You want to make sure that you understand what your competencies are, and you also want to reach out. At NITAC, we are an open book. I mean, you can call me, call the director, call anyone there. And they just go out to the, the NITAC help site, uh, our help desk, and if, you're, if it's help you need or advice, ask. And I guarantee someone to have a call back to you within 72 hours. That's just what we do. So we're actually looking for those partnerships. We want to uh, grow and develop small businesses because when you think about it, uh, Walmart and Amazon were small businesses at one time and now they're leading the charge. So I think the major thing here is to focus on um, what you can do and not focusing on the stuff that is outside of your control. So what you can control is your skill set. You can control uh, your development of your capabilities and you can control your opportunities. Thank you, Ricky, thank you very much. And I just want to build on, on what you're talking about that I know that there's there's a myth out there that category management is synonymous with bundling. Sure. And it isn't. It's isn't it? really about managing by market segment and recognizing that our federal marketplace is truly um, like the US economy at large. It's not a monolithic economy. Right. And so what category management enables us to do from the government side is ensure that we understand the best practices and these pain points in each of the sub markets. And this allows us to better organize ourselves and actually understand where small business is going to have a greater opportunity. And let me add to that, it has a different level of granularity. It also allows us to look at the subcategories and the categories to drill down. So if we're missing an opportunity, we can take that opportunity and address it immediately. Absolutely. And I thought EPA, I thought the, uh, the, the, the team from the Environmental Protection Agency on the earlier presentation did a great job of showing that. Yes. So um, I want to just sort of wrap up with one question to Cheryl, because we're talking a lot, because, and this goes um, along the lines of, of where we're going, which is the administration's talked a lot about diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And there's been um, executive orders, there's been directives around that area. And 
really looking at some of the things that GSA is doing to bring in that vendor pool so then they can do all of the things that that Ricky and Darlene and you have talked about Cheryl, which is successfully winning task orders. So what, what's GSA doing, Cheryl? Thank you, Laura. Um, we're very proud at GSA to already have a diverse vendor pool. We roughly have 47% of our vendors who are small, disadvantaged businesses and woman-owned businesses in the MASS program. With our recent 8A STARS Award, we have over 1,100 vendors and we are still continuing to on-ramp in the spirit of meeting the administrators, uh, administration's DEI and A goals. For our small disadvantaged businesses within the MASS program, we're also going to be offering enhanced support uh, we plan to do a lot of hand holding as we on board our new vendor, uh, our new vendors, not just from the beginning of getting an award, but also uh, post award as well. Mm -hmm. uh, they too will benefit <coughs> from the marketing training as well as a plethora of opportunities. We expect to drive through our strategic partnerships with other agencies. We plan to have on ramps and all our upcoming, uh, uh, upcoming acquisition vehicles in order to infuse uh, new capabilities onto our, both our GWACs and our mass contract vehicles. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. And um, I, I, we're out of time, that sort of flew by. And we, I, I truly think that this panel just gave some excellent advice and, and sort of some, some great starting points. On to help um, to help our the audience of small businesses uh, find find ways to identify primes, get out there, market yourselves, and these resources are available through the different websites that um, we will be sharing out. I saw some requests, Ricky, for for the NITAC site. I know that there's going to be requests for for soup as well as G there were some questions about GSA too. So. We'll make sure to get some answers to those back to everybody who asked those questions in the chat. But really just thank you to all three of you for some great guidance and great, great suggestions to, to our audience today. We have a poll, um, and I'm sure that everyone's sensing a theme at this point. And, um, but we do have a poll and we'd love to hear from you about what you wanna know more about from us. Um, we are using the results for this on the itvendormanagement.gsa.gov um, website. So feel free to check out that because that is an that's an office that is um, really representing all of the government-wide IT category, and it's specifically for vendor engagement. Um, and or so either reach out to the website at itvmo.gsa.gov or email us at itvmo.gsa.gov to get communicate to be added to our listserv and quarterly newsletter. Um, I know that there were a couple of questions about events. The IT government wide category will be join, joining the Coalition for Government Procurement in May to talk more about small business. And there'll be a joint event in June with um, GUT ACT to IAC. Uh, to take a, a deeper look at the small business experience within the IT acquisition lifecycle. Um, but also feel free to reach out to us. Um, we, do, we spend a lot of time listening and understanding the challenges and looking for ways that we can remove, that we can lower the barriers to entry as you heard on this, on this session. So thank you so much. And Alyssa, I will pass it back to you. Thank you. Great, thank you all. Um, that was a great panel, so much great information. Um, just in case anyone um, was curious, if they cannot have access to the poll, um, I am turning off, turning off the chat so you are able to answer the question. Um, if you're unable to answer the poll question through the polling system, the question is what resources and or topics do you want to learn about or need? Please select all that apply, on-ramping or off-ramping, FedRAMP certification, security clearance, ITBIC vehicle solutions, or other, please drop in the chat or email us at itvmo at gsa.gov.
So I'll give everyone a few minutes. If you're unable to answer through the polling system, we do ask that you answer through the chat just to provide everyone the opportunity to answer this poll. Also, as another note, um, since we are a bit tight on our schedule, we will take all of your questions that did not get answered back to our speakers and see if um, we can share relevant responses in our follow-up email. Last but not least, we will hear a session on best practices for requirements gathering. This is presented by Jonathan Evans, Program Manager, Civilian Services Acquisition Workshops Office um, within the Pro Professional Services and Human Capital categories in the Federal, oh, the Federal Acquisition Service in GSA. So Jonathan, I will turn it over to you. Hey, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. I uh, hope everyone is uh, getting something fantastic out of this, these presentations today. Uh, I know I have, and I'm in government, so um, I'm learning a lot. Um, this next segment uh, should be kind of fun. Um, we're gonna do something a little different than maybe uh, you've experienced in one of these sessions before. So I'm gonna share a little bit with you about what we are doing um, with, within my program to coach and mentor agencies on how to write requirements, write better requirements. Um, after I've shared that with you, um, there's going to be an opportunity for you to share some feedback with me, feedback that I can take and share with other government agencies. So um, it should be a little interactive uh, and hopefully a little bit fun. So let's get right to it. So um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about what we are doing within our Civilian Service Acquisition Workshops program. This is a uh, government program for government. So uh, what we do is we have a network of government facilitators, and we go out and work with government acquisition teams and assist them in developing their requirements. Um, and we are coaching them on how to do performance-based requirements. Uh, essentially, a performance-based requirement is a requirement that is written in terms of the results or outcomes that the government is hoping to achieve instead of telling contractors, telling industry how to do the work. So uh, for years, we've known that you, industry, have these great best practices, innovations. Uh, you know how to do the work. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. So instead of telling you how to do your work, uh, we tell you the results or outcomes that we're looking for. Uh, and ask you to bring back uh, the solution. So that's the focus of what we do in these facilitated workshops. Uh, so I, I myself and I have a few other team members that go around, we work with acquisition teams so far in the last two years. We've done about uh, 18 workshops uh, with acquisition teams across government. And uh, that accounts for about $3.25 billion in spend. Uh, from those acquisitions. We have worked across categories. So we've worked in professional services, in IT, in medical, in facilities and construction. Um, and there's one I'm forgetting, I'm sure. But uh, so it, it, our, our work crosses categories. It crosses agencies. Uh, we've worked with lots of agencies. Um, and what we do is we get the entire acquisition team together. That means the contracting staff and the program staff, the requirements owners, we bring them together and we say, okay, let's figure out your requirements. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit of behind the scenes, how the sausage is made, how we are going about teaching agencies to develop their requirements so that you can get a bit of an understanding of what we are uh, training our acquisition workforce on. Uh, and then, as I said, we'll get to some questions uh, to get some feedback from you. So the first thing to note about how we are teaching acquisition teams within government to develop their requirements is we are teaching a building block process. That is, uh, we want our acquisition teams, our government teams to develop their requirements, starting with the foundational elements. Why are you doing this? Um, give us the vision. What's your aspirational goal for why you are contracting for this requirement? And I think that's important, isn't it? Uh, for you, especially in industry. Uh, you, you sit down, you look at a, at a government requirements document, and, and oftentimes uh, you might have to scroll through four, five, six pages before you finally even get to a background section that talks about who the agency is. Uh, and what we are encouraging agencies to do is put the bottom line up front. What's your aspirational goal? What are you trying to achieve? What's your vision? 
And then what's your mission, the next building block? So what do you want this acquisition to do? Who is it for? And what are the perceived benefits of doing it? So we think that those are two really good starting places that, that often get left out of most requirements documents. And so we're trying to uh, work with agencies to bake these in, to build these into their requirements. The next thing is high level objectives. So some of you may have heard of a statement of objectives um, and that's a great document. Generally, when we use that in the government, we put out a list of high level objectives and we ask you to come back with a performance work statement. Um, slight twist on that, what we're encouraging agencies to do is as they're developing the requirements, whether they're going out with a statement of objectives or a performance work statement, develop the high level objectives so that you industry can know what are the big objectives for this? I, I get it. I get your aspirational goal. You want to save the world. Good. What do you want this acquisition to do? Okay, got it. It's being done for this group within your agency. Okay, good. I see what you're trying to get after. All right, and here's your high-level objectives. Okay, you want to accomplish this in this task area, and you want to accomplish this in this task area. Okay, so um, hopefully what we're doing, and I'll, I'll, I'll fact check that with you here in just a minute, Hopefully what we're doing is laying some building blocks that better communicate to you industry what the government is trying to procure. Then, and only then, we work with agencies on their requirements themselves. Now, when I say requirements, I'm talking about statements in the contract document that start with the contractor shall, right? It's telling you exactly what, you, what we want from you, the results or outcomes. And uh, one of the things that we have found is that a lot of government requirement statements are huge. Sometimes they're half a page long. It starts off with a contractor shall, and then it's a run on sentence for half a page, all the things under that one statement. So what we do is we work with, uh, with agencies and say, hey, look, let's break that up. Let's get precise. Maybe there's several different requirements within that paragraph. Let's break it down. Uh, and we try and, and, and eliminate ambiguity. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. Then once the, the uh, agency has their requirements, the next step is to establish performance standards. And this is challenging. Uh, and you should know that. It's very challenging for the government to figure out exactly what level of quality or timeliness to associate with a particular requirement. Especially sometimes requirements aren't quite known. We have a general idea. We might need a little bit of this. We might need a little bit of that but it isn't known today. So how do we set that standard today? Uh, so we work with agencies on, and this starts to tie into uh, conversations about their acquisition strategy, uh, their contract type, whether they're going to do uh, kind of an open, indefinite quantity, indefinite delivery type contract where they can issue multiple task orders, or whether they're going to leverage a best in class contract, as, as was mentioned earlier, where there are several best in class contracts Maybe issuing an order against that where you can set the standards. Okay, now we know what the requirements, now we set the standards, now we'll order it. As opposed to setting up a contract, thinking maybe we'll order it in the future. So uh, performance standards are important. And one of the things that we often hear on the government side is, <clears throat> man, industry just doesn't seem to get it. We really want this and they just aren't delivering. And I asked them, I said, well, have you been clear in telling industry what your expectations are? And then we go and we look at the documentation. Nine times out of 10, there is not sufficient clarity. So we work with agencies on developing uh, better clarity on their performance standards. So that's our building block process. That's how we're working with agencies on helping, helping them develop their uh, requirements. Um, we are also uh, sharing with them some best practices in market research. Uh, one of the things that, that I've heard from industry in the past and that we are taking and sharing with government agencies is, hey, uh, the, the amount of time that you put things out there matters. So if you put an RFI out there for two weeks, that might not be enough time. Give them some more time. If you put your actual request for proposal out there, your RFP out there for 30 days, but it's a multi-million dollar requirement, that might not be enough time, especially if industry, small businesses in particular, have not had the lead time understanding that, that the requirement is going to be posted. So we work, we work with them on market research. Uh, we work with them on those building blocks. The other thing we work on, as you can see here, is, is getting to a, a level of precision 
and concision. That is to be uh, short and sweet, to the point. What is your requirement? So rather than saying, and we often do this in government, we often say, well, the contractor shall, or the contractor may be required to support such and such a person with the develop with supporting this and assisting that and managing some ambiguity here and there. And, and somebody could read that and go, what in the heck is the government trying to buy? I don't get it. Nine times out of 10, the government doesn't understand it either. So what we try and work with them on is say, let's get specific. What do you want? What's the result or outcome you're looking for? Well, we need a user guide. Oh, okay. That sounds like a result. What do you need? Do you need them to create a user guide? Do you need them to uh, update a user guide? Do you need them to revise it? Do you need them to edit it? What, what do you need? Well, we don't have one. Oh, okay. So what do you want to say? Well, we want them to develop it. Got it. So now we've gotten uh, precise with our language. We want contractor to develop a user guide and then provide some context. What kind of user guide? For loading data into redacted system, whatever it is, right? So tell, tell a little bit about what that user guide is to entail. Now in the actual, when, it, when, it, when the, the rubber hits the road, there's probably gonna be some additional context outlined here, um, giving you, the industry, uh, some, some better understanding of, of expectations for the user guide. That will also come up in those performance standards. But the idea is that it's precise and concise and, and you hopefully in industry look at this and go, okay, I know what it would take to develop a user guide for that system on how to load data in. I, I could probably uh, use this person, you know, and, and it would probably take them, I don't know, 120 hours and they could put together a user guide delivered to the government. It would be fantastic. So then you, you put together your proposal and you price it out based on the information the government's provided. So it's incumbent upon us, the government, to provide you sufficient information to make an accurate price proposal. And part of that starts with having clear requirements. Another example here, a contractor shall conduct a sprint demo. So for those of you who are in the agile IT sphere, right, that's gonna sound very familiar to you. So conduct an, a sprint demo to ensure that the feature acceptance criteria were met at the conclusion of each sprint. Now, if you're not working in IT, then this may not make sense to you, you may not know what, what this all means. Um, we are also not, one of the things we're not doing is we're not asking uh, government agencies that we work with to dumb down their language to a point uh, where just about anybody can understand it, right? If you work in an agile IT sphere and you don't know what this means, you probably need to reconsider what you're doing in the agile IT sphere. But if you work in the agile IT sphere, you know what this means. We don't need to spell it out for you. And those are the companies that the government wants to work with, the ones that know. But we do want to eliminate ambiguity, words like assist with, support, help, manage. Well, what kind of assistance? What is involved with support? Support could mean anything. I could say, hey, yeah, I'm sure, I support you. Go get it, right? And that might be good enough. I might, have said, I might be convinced I've accomplished the requirement. The government might have a very different view of what support looks like. So we tell the government, hey, it's time to spell it out. What does support mean to you? So hopefully in doing this, we are able to, to get these requirements out to you, industry, more uh, clearer, uh, more precise, uh, easier to digest, and easier to propose to. So that's what we're doing on, on our end. Uh, it's not happening universally, uh, right? So uh, we, our program is only able to affect, you know, certain number of acquisitions each year, but we do try and uh, get around to several different agencies. Um, and so uh, I, I see a question in chat I'll, I'll, or in Q&A right now, I'll answer it. So um, we do this work, we do this kind of facilitation, coaching, consulting work um, for other government agencies. So uh, I, I work at GSA, but um, we facilitate requirements sessions with acquisition teams um, at various agencies. Uh, we've worked with NASA and EPA. Uh, we've worked with um, Department of Commerce. We've worked with Department of Justice. So uh, we work with lots of different agencies, helping them to write the requirements. Hopefully that answers your question. If it doesn't, let me know. So 
the next thing that I would like to do is I would like to ask you all a question. So in order to facilitate this, um, I'm going to ask our wonderful folks at ATARC, if you could please enable the chat for all of the participants. Okay, so uh, I am about to put a question up on the screen and I am going to ask you, industry, to help us out by responding to it in chat. Um, this is a little, a slightly different way of getting at a poll question. We're gonna do it in the chat because I want your answers. I don't wanna give you pre prefabricated answers. I want you to tell me the answer to it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna give you some time to do this. Starting off with our first question, uh, the first question is, what is the biggest challenge with the way government requirements are written today? So go ahead and find that chat feature. It should be at the bottom of your screen um, next to the Q&A. Alyssa, can you confirm that we were able to en enable chat? Yes, chat was Perfect. enabled. Got it. All right. So I'm seeing some stuff come in now, lots of good stuff. So uh, the requirements are not specific enough. Uh, it's a copy and paste from previous. They're ambiguous, lots of ambiguity. Okay, there's a lack of information. Um, okay, too vague, vagary. All right, unclear language and needs. There's no vision. There's no clear understanding of what they're trying to do. Got it. They're huge, multi-page books. My goodness, yeah, and and so yeah, so that's another thing we do, right? So on the government side, we we put together this request for proposal. It's a million pages long, and then we tell you, uh, give us your response in ten pages or less. Well, wait, why? Why does industry have to give us ten pages or less, but we can give them a million pages of a requirements document? There's a disconnect there. Um, Okay, there's some stuff about starting to get into a little bit of detail about what happens after award. Um, okay, written too globally, too wordy. All right, got it. So lots of really great responses. I appreciate you taking the time to do that. Uh, we will definitely be collecting all of these responses and using this um, and sharing this, um, you know, where we can make a difference. So I will definitely be using this in my program. Uh, to help coach teams, but I know that the category management PMO will also use this. Um, so good. So let's do this. Let's try um, another question here. I think this will be um, kind of an interesting one. So let's see. Let me switch gears here and I'm going to put a new question in. So take a pause on uh, that last question and let's Shift to this new question. So here we go. So the new question is, da, 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 da. what signals have you seen in government acquisitions that tells you that the government is probably going with the incumbent? You ever seen that before? You ever seen read, read through an acquisition or seen something in the market research, either an RFI or or the duration, the window duration. What, what sort of things do you see that and you're like, I don't know. I don't think that's worth my time. It sounds like they're just going to go with whoever has it now. What are those things? Let's hear them. Short response times. That's right. Um, if you said something about a short response time, um, do me a favor, add a little bit to that. What's short to you? How, how short is short? Is short 30 days? Is it two weeks? Is it 45 days? Oh my word, two days, that's very, very short, okay. Got it, all right, lots of good stuff coming in here. Um, let's see what else we have. Trying to find the section here, okay. Excellent responses coming in. Um, looking for very specific past performance, okay, got it. Um, not enough time to, to put the proposal together. Uh, it's it, RFI is issued on a Friday and due the next morning on a Saturday. Come on, government, let's get our act together, right? Okay. Must have experience working with XXX program. So the program office that issues it said you have to have experience working with us before. Well, yeah, that's going to eliminate a lot from the competition, isn't it? 
Okay. Um, key personnel request that looks like a resume. Yeah, okay. So we really like working with so-and-so. So we're going to just copy and paste their resume right here into our requirements document. All right. Specific language that only the incumbent can do. Okay, location. Things like location. You have to be located within X number of miles of an office. Uh, tailored to a specific tool, perhaps one that was created by the current incumbent. Absolutely. Okay, so um, that's all incredibly useful. Um, so hopefully you're liking this. Uh, this is you know a great opportunity for you to, to share back um, to, to government, and we can take all this and digest it. Let's have a high dollar value. PP, past performance, high dollar, high dollar value, past performance. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That, that's an interesting, very specific requirement having that much. Um, hey, Dwayne, you know, I've seen your question uh, a couple of times. I saw it in the q and I'm not sure um, where that forecast is, but I know that we can send that request off to EPA and uh, get an answer for you on the, the Cedarwood uh, forecast. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can get an answer to you. All right. So the next question and the final question before we wrap up here. Um, so we've already said, you know, what signals do you see that, that the government is probably going to go with the incumbent, but now I want to flip the script and say, if there was something the government could do to signal you that they really want competition, Right, that they they don't necessarily just want to go with the incumbent. Then, what could the government do to signal industry that they are seeking a wide open competition on a recompete? What would be significant to you? So say it. Okay, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> an industry day, got it. Plain language, okay. Corporate experience instead of past performance. The award day, okay. Have an industry day that, spe that gives specifics, clear specifics, got it. Uh, exact level of effort, okay. Oh, uniform response requirements, interesting, got it. It stated that it's a wide open competition, okay. <clears throat> All right, excellent stuff. So keep it coming, this is, this is incredibly useful, incredibly helpful. So, so sometimes, um, you know, when a government is contemplating, you know, a recompete, I can tell you, I've worked with lots of different agencies um, who've shared with me. They've said, "Hey, you know, we have been using the same vendor for so many years, um, and we really, we really, really like to see more competition. But we just every time we go out with the recompete, we seem to just get the proposal back from the same vendor. Um, and they can't, you know, as a government, we can't just go out and say, "Hey, you know, ABC company, I'm tired of working with you." I'd like to open it up and get everybody else to play in the same sandbox. So, you know, go away. We can't do that. So, uh, you know, things that you're sharing here are really helpful. You know, having an industry day, being clearer about the requirements, that's incredibly helpful. Uh, emailing vendors, uh, the solicitation that qualify, uh, posting a draft RFI uh, with the PWS attached, um, asking for specific industry-based solutions. Um, kind of getting, getting some of that information out there during the market research phase, all really good stuff. Have a bake-off. I love that. Why not have a bake-off? Good. Um, fantastic. So um, these are great responses. You're welcome to keep uh, responding in there. Um, if there are, let me check the Q&A, see if there's any direct questions for me. Uh, does your office need contractor support? Um, yes, I, I wish, I wish I had a budget for it. I don't. Um, but I, I, if I had a budget, you better believe it. I would love it. Um, let's see, you seeing some responses in Q and a communication gap between the program office and the contracting office. Yes. So if, if there's one thing that I encourage, you know, when I'm talking with government agencies and, you know, talking about how to improve their requirements development process, 
how to improve their, their market research, how to improve their, their competition and source selection. The, the number one thing that I tell them is it starts with the team. You have to have the program office, the requirements owners, the ones who want the work done, working closely with the contracting folks, the ones that understand the federal acquisition regulations, the policy, they have to be working closely together, very closely together and throughout the entire process. Um, typically in government, one of the challenges we have is that we put it on the program office to develop the requirements, then pass it over the fence to contracting, who then goes and does their stuff and then maybe passes something back to the program and it's a back and forth and back and forth. It's very inefficient. Uh, but when we see them work together, uh, we see better things happen. We see better requirements developed. We see um, better consideration of industry's needs. And so that is one of the first things that we uh, work with agencies on. Uh, all right. Um, compile request to compile the answers and share those out. I'm, I'm not sure about that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We might be able to get some, some degree of a summary, um, of these out. I'm not sure. So, um, we'll see what happens with that. Any other questions? If anybody's got any questions, feel free to drop those in the Q and A pad, Q and A pod. Um, there's a question in here. Are our facilitation services on a fee for service basis? No. So we actually, our program currently, we are a free service. Um, so we're government to government support. So we go out and conduct these workshops uh, for free to our uh, brothers, sisters at other agencies without charging them. At least that's our model for right now. Uh, at some point in the future, uh, we might. Um, Annie, thank you for that comment. I appreciate it. Yes, I, I think the work that we're doing is important and essential as well. Um, we continue to work to try and extend our reach by developing a broad network. So we are actually working on training facilitators across government. So um, I am basically a staff of two and a half, and we do um, as many workshops as we can in a given fiscal year. Um, but right now we're working with several agencies to train up staff internal to those agencies to be able to carry on this work. Uh, we work very closely with Office of Federal Procurement Policy to coordinate um, outreach and, and uh, connections with, with agencies. If you've heard of Department of Homeland Security's Procurement Innovation Lab or Department of Commerce, they have a procurement innovation lab called uh, The Lab. Uh, we're working very closely with them. And those two entities are also working with lots of government uh, acquisition teams. So uh, we're constantly looking at ways to share these best practices, to promulgate this around government, uh, because it's so important. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, Tina, I saw your company, your, your comment. We, we have done some work with uh, USAID. Um, I'd be happy to tag up with you and talk about what we've done over there. We've actually had some folks from USAID go through our facilitation training. So uh, that's fantastic. Um, good. I think this, I uh, just, I, I can't thank you enough. This was kind of an experiment. I, I don't know if we've ever tried to do anything like this before to kind of gather open feedback from you, um, in, in this kind of broad general format, but it's fantastic and it's so helpful and, uh, we will definitely act on it and use it and, and incorporate it into our, uh, facilitated training sessions. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, Unless there's any other questions, I will pass it back to Alyssa. Great, thank you so much. Um, it looks like we have one more poll question for you. Um, it says, if there was one piece of information you would like to see the government do a better job in or job sharing in a forecast, what would it be? Um, please feel free to answer in the poll um, answers. And if um, you're not able to use the polling function, please use the chat. So we'll give everyone a few minutes or seconds.
Um, and then just in case you are not able to see the answers, the answers are project description, point of contact to answer questions, RFP release date, current contract number if the solicitation is a recompete or contract type. Great, and it looks like we're going to share those results. So I'll share them on the screen. Jonathan, I didn't know if you had anything to say about those. If not, that's completely fine. Yeah, um, I think you know our the forecasting thing is something that's that's coming up a lot um, in terms of you know, hey, it's you know you could give us sixty days, ninety days to respond to a, a request for proposal, but if we don't know that it's coming, um, then we're you know if we're small business, we're scrambling to try and come up with the resources, even with that timeline to try and do a proposal. So. Uh, these forecasting opportunities, you know, the, the sooner we can get out there and share that. And I think agencies, uh, I know our portfolio, I work in the professional services category. Um, I know that we have forecasting events um, pretty frequently. I saw somebody asked a question in, in the chat or in the Q&A earlier um, about how, do, how, does, uh, how does small businesses, how does industry find out about forecasting events, which I think is a great question. I don't know. I wish I knew. Um, so I think that would be great. And I'll, I'll kind of take that back to the powers that be and see if there's um, kind of a one stop shop to share out, you know, where can, where can industry find out more information about forecasting? I think it's great. Great. Um, so thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Brian for his closing remarks. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, first, I want to thank all of our speakers for their time today, as well as eight Atark and my team for hosting and facilitating our event. I uh, hope the information they shared was useful to all of you as you look to participate in category management across the government. Um, finally, before you sign out, we'd appreciate you taking our closeout survey so that we can use that feedback to enhance future sessions. Um, please also be on the lookout for, for news about uh, future industry days. Uh, we, we tend to host these at least once or twice a year. And um, lastly, I want to thank you all for your participation today and hope you enjoy the rest of your days. <laughs>